Hey everybody, uh, this is the last talk of the day here at the Launchpad stage. Uh, we're really excited to move from thinking about innovation in education to moving to thinking about innovation in real estate. Um, the talk you're gonna hear next is from a company that's running right here in Miami, thinking about the future of the real estate market and what it can look like. Uh, and part of what they're doing that's, that's really exciting is thinking about you know, how can technology and the physical world interact and what's that look like as technology starts to offer new solutions and new approaches. Uh, the Emerge Americas team, before we introduce the panel, wants to thank again Ingle and Volkers, they're right over here, for being the uh, sponsor of the real estate section today. Uh, so please welcome uh, up to the stage uh, Oliver Grinda, the Chief Executive Officer of Home 61. Thank you, man. Wow, don't need this. Oh, you got it? Yeah, got it. Well, hello, hello. My name is Olivia Grinda, and I'm here to talk to you about the rise of real estate tech as the next housing crisis. Now, given the crowd that we have here, you all know that real estate tech is getting a very big boom. The first thing that we need to see is that real estate tech inf investment is influenced by the housing crisis. As you will see, the housing crisis before had, uh, before the housing crisis, we had actually raised about $330 million in real estate tech investment. But two years into the crisis, this dropped to just 10% of it and barely $33 million in investment. This, of course, has boomed since. Last year, in, um, it, the market had grown from $1 billion in investment to $1.25 billion in investment in real estate tech. And real estate tech is really approaching every single aspect of the market. Well, you will see that you will see the market being attacked by startups on the commercial side, on the investment side, on the residential side, on the property management side, and so on. And it makes sense. The real estate market in the US is 38 trillion market. It is the largest market in the world. Of those 38 trillion, Two trillion is being invested and transacted every single year. To give you a comparison, the entire retail market in the US is 3.8 trillion. So the, U the US real estate market is absolutely huge. And on top of that, people do not like the status quo. What we see, for example, is that in the residential market, 75% of people do not like working with real estate agents. And yet, they're part of 92% of every single real estate transaction. But this is also true for every single aspect of, uh, of uh, the real estate. In commercial, people have a database that is antiquated and did not have critical mass. In investment, it is very difficult to find what is a good investment. You're lacking transparency. In terms of um, property management, you're also lacking transparency. And this created great opportunity for startups. And this is why you see startups in the commercial space, like Nautel. You'll see in the investment space, you will see companies like Roofstock. In the residential space, you will see companies like Home61. All of them trying to make a very big changes. Some of the bigger name, like Compass, trying to attack the, the high-end market and the foreclosure market and the, the low-end and asset swap being attacked by companies like Knock. But what is perhaps more surprising is that all of those companies all of this investment ultimately right now have a very, very small impact. Currently, the entire real estate tech industry only represent 0.04% of the market. To give you a comparison, Remax by itself represent 8% of the market, is therefore 200 times bigger than the entire real estate tech market in its entirety. But that's actually normal. The reason it is normal is because despite the fact that the market is in its infancy and the offline world and the current status quo is disliked, it is currently good enough. What's really gonna make a change, and my premise for this presentation is that the next housing crisis is where you're gonna see profound transformative change into the market. So first, we need to understand what happens when there is a housing crisis? Well, perhaps as expected, the market shrinks. But it shrinks a lot more than you expect. 
In 2005, 2006, we were at $1.7 trillion of existing homes being transacted. Just a few years later, we're at 0 0.7 trillion, meaning that in five short years, we lost a trillion dollars in size of market. That is absolutely huge, and it is now recovering. And this is caused by two particular effects. The first effect is that the number of transactions shrank tremendously. It went from 7.1 million transactions every year to 4.1 million transactions just a few years later. At the same time, the price per home actually diminished, meaning that the entire market went down. But one of the things that we don't take, care, take into consideration often is the other effect. For example, did you know that one third of the entire real estate agent workforce fell out of the market within five years? We lost 400 real estate agents within the spam of only five years. But at the same time, it also created a huge rise in foreclosure. The number of foreclosure completely exploded. And so this was very transformative for the market. And a lot of people lost a lot of things. A lot of companies went out of business. A lot of people lost their job. But this actually created an incredible space for innovation. At that time, several companies came, were created, and rose to become the master of their field. Here are some of the examples. So we see auction.com. Auction.com, for you, for those who do not know, was created in 2005 and is basically a way to bid is basically a way to bid on, the, um, on foreclosure and distressed homes. At the, height of its, of the height of its transaction number, we see that auction.com represented 1% of every single real estate transaction in the US and was sold recently for a billion dollars. At the same time, we see Zillow. Zillow recently, um, Zillow actually currently represents the real estate market. When you think about real estate, you think about Zillow. This is where people go and search initially. What you might not know is that it's not an old company. It was created in 2005, 2006, and really was very small at the time of the crash. But something happened during the crash that made it the behemoth that it is today. What happened is that the number of transactions fell down, and for real estate agents that stuck into the market, it became very, very hard to find new clients. In the era of the bubble, they, to find a client, they just had to ask whoever wanted to buy a home. Everybody said yes, and you could find a client. When the bubble burst, they need to find new lead generation. They needed to find a way to capture a new client. And Zillow was a platform to be. And so when you see everybody struggling during the crisis, you see the revenue of Zillow skyrocketing. And it became now synchronon with the real estate market. What's even more interesting is that this is not only a tech innovation space when there is a crisis, but even the offline world updates itself when there is a crisis. What you see is that Remax, who had already introduced a 100% commission split in the desk fee, actually accelerated this process, moving away from transaction business and more into a franchise business, charging their agents desk fee and transaction fee because it was a lot easier to do this rather, than, um, rather than, than wait for a transaction business where the number of transactions was actually falling down. And this was true for Remax, but a lot of other franchises actually as a business. So what we see is that while crisis is, of course, very difficult for a lot of people, it also sets the stage to reshape market. And this is not unlike it, how it is for the technology pure place. What we will see is that in the dot-com era, we saw the exact same phenomenon. If you look in the early 2000s, there was a lot of horror stories. Companies that raised gazillions of dollars who were primed to go IPO, failed to go IPO, and ultimately disappeared. Some of those examples are, of course, uh, pe uh, Pets.com, Boo.com, and Webcam. Those are some of the biggest failure in terms of the startup bust. And it's still today regarded as some of the exuberance of the, um, of the startups and the bubbles. But we need to look further than that. We need to look at the companies that were created right before a crisis and actually survived the crisis. What became of this? What became of them? And the reality is that they became the master of their game. Those are some of those companies. What you see is that Google is actually a quite recent company. It was created in uh, 1998. And at that time, there was a lot of competition 
with other search engines. There was Yahoo, there was Lycos, and when the bubble, when the bubble burst, actually they were the one with a better product, with a little bit more financial management, and they were able to grow to such an extent that they're today the top-ranked website in the world and also expanded in a lot of different categories, uh, whether it is um, emails, intelligence, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, and so forth. It's a very similar story for eBay. eBay, one of the oldest companies here, was created in 95, was also able to grow fast enough and secure enough, uh, enough money that in the face of a um, recession, in the face of the bubble bursting, they survived and grew exponentially. During the recession, they actually grew and started acquiring companies throughout the world. The other company that's very interesting is, of course, Amazon. Amazon is actually the oldest company here, created in 94. In 94, it grew as a simple e-commerce to sell books, and that's it. But when the bubble burst, they actually had the opportunity, now no longer faced with competition, with a, with a green field and lots of capital, they were able to reinvent themselves from um, basically an online library to a retailer. And then they kept on growing and went into retail, went into um, selling server space, and now launching rockets into the space. And so this was given an opportunity to exist because the entire market basically tumbled on itself. Now perhaps the most important company for us here is Netflix. Netflix was created in 97. And in 97, it was basically competing directly with its, mar with its uh, offline market, Blockbuster. It was a DVD rental service. When the market crashed and they could no longer raise money, they could no longer afford to have big warehouses with DVDs. They could no longer afford to have such a big uh, product. So they evolved. They evolved with no competition to become a content gateway. And with this, they were able to grow, outstrip the competition, get Blockbuster actually to completely close, and now are still reinventing themselves today to become a content creation website. So this is very interesting. We see that in the real estate space, whenever there is a crisis, it leads way to major changes in the market. And we see that in the technology industry, this happens too. And my premise is that now that we have invested over a billion dollars year over year in real estate tech, when the next crisis arrives, the entire market is going to be taken over by technology. And the reason it's important to talk about this today is because of this. This is the Robert Schilling Index. This shows that the, we have now reached a point where prices for home has actually peaked over the, the, previous, um, the previous crisis mode in 2006. Now, the entire theory of Robert Schilling is that prices, the prices of home do not have a particular reason to grow over time above inflation. Basically, if there is an increase in demand, you'll have an increase in supply and it will go back towards the means and always adjust it for inflation. What is currently happening is that the price increase in the homes is surpassing some, sometime over 40% over inflation. This is true in Portland, this is true in Denver. It's 20% in Austin, in Houston, it's about 10% in Miami. And this is actually very scary. It's very scary because we're currently seeing a repeat as before. This very high price hike is artificially created by the Fed. Now, this is the interest rate set by the Feds. And what we see is in early 2000, all the way to 2006, the interest rate were very, very low. We're actually at an all-time low. This created um, the sentiment for investors to go yield chasing and started getting as much leverage as they could. At the same time, people finally wanted to buy a home. They could afford it. Capital was there. And this pushed the prices of home much higher than it actually should have. At the same time, the banks didn't want to lose out on the, on the current market that was growing. A lot more people got interested in real estate and they started making loans to people who didn't have the good credit score and started creating some prime uh, mortgages. When, people, when the Fed tried to course correct and increase the interest rate, what happened is that people with variable uh, loans started falling out of the market, started tum the market started tumbling, People who wanted to, uh, to buy stopped stop buying, stopped getting loans because the loans were more expensive and people were starting to default. And suddenly the house of cards fell down. Now, this is extremely relevant because for the last eight years, the Fed, in order to kickstart the economy, 
has brought in the interest rate even lower at 0%. This is what created the big spike in, in prices. At the same time, there is other element that makes that today's prices are very inflated. One of the big changes that's been happening is that zoning laws are actually becoming tighter and tighter. In, the, in New York, for example, 40% of the buildings that are currently there would not be built today. And so you see that demand is currently outpacing supply, and so affordable housing is diminishing in the US. At the same time, you see house prices that are increasing, and you see a stagnation in terms of salaries and income of people. And so people are being displaced further and further away from, um, from pr uh, production centers, further, f further away where they can have the major input, output, and are either now having more inefficiencies or are moving to other regions that are now cheaper and creating the same cycle over and over again. So we are going to be facing a new housing crisis in the near future. And what is going to happen at that time? Well, a few things are going to happen. The number of houses transacted is going to fall. That's for sure. The price per house is going to fall. The number of real estate agents is going to fall. The amount of investment in real estate tech is going to fall. And a lot of companies are going to die, including some unicorns of today is going to die. But, but it's going to entirely recreate the entire landscape. What we're going to see is that some of the companies that are currently on the market, some of the companies that are currently being expanded right now are going to become the juggernaut of tomorrow. The same way we've seen the Googles of the time being a very small search engine, the same way Amazon was just basically an online library and became a huge company, we are currently on the precipice to see some of those companies become some of the biggest startup in the world. So yes, there is going to be a crisis. Yeah, it's going to be tough. But it's all going to be super exciting for whoever is going to be this market. It's going to be a rough ride. Capital is going to be tight. The, uh, but there will be less competition from the offline and from the online world. And whoever wins this is actually going to be creating the next Amazon, the next Google. So my message to you who are entrepreneurs, today is the time to build the next behemoth. It is today is the day to create the next Google, the next Amazon. Nothing has been done. Everything has to be done right now. And for you investors in the room, it is time to be bold, it is time to support those company, and it is time to make a bet so that you can be part of a magical, amazing startups that are going to be going, changing the entire market. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Mayor Oliver Grinda, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Let me see. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. So my business is, of course, in real estate tech. And, um, and I'm attacking the market from the residential side, trying to improve the way um, transactions on the buy side and sell side are done. So to give you an idea, we're like a brokerage, but much better. Our agents make four times more than the average real estate agents. They make 17 times more transaction. And our, our clients like us a lot better. We're the top rated real estate agency in Miami. My company is called Home 61. All right. So we, we operate um, like a brokerage. So we have real estate, real estate agents that are working with us. And they make, uh, transa they make transactions. And we get a, a cut of those transactions. However, we automatize everything at that point. So we find the client. We qualify the clients. We have an algorithm that will match the best client with our be best potential agents. We give advanced data analytics. We summarize uh, all the contracts are automatic. And you can follow the transaction from A to Z. Furthermore, we're currently launching a new program for the listing side, which we're going to be attacking the listing commission, where people are going to, are going to be working with us. They're going to get a listing specialist, advanced data, an inter um, advanced reporting. And they're going to be paying only a flat fee of $6,100 instead of 3% commission, saving on average about $17,000 for each commission. So we're going to be on both sides, on the buy side and on the sell side. Anything, anybody else? All right. All right. Sure.
that's encouraged into more green cake, now there's going to be a little bit more competition here. So what, what, what makes you feel that that won't create a natural reversion to the beans? Absolutely. So the, the question for people we didn't hear is that um, for the longer, for longest time, interest rates were, were artificially low, and particularly with quantitative, quantitative easing that was, that was um, keeping it low. Uh, now that this is done, the interest rates are going to go up. Now, you're absolutely right. The, this, is actually, this is actually the same attempt that the Fed had done in 2006 by in, increasing interest rate to move away from, in, from, um, from artificial inflation in prices, but that had backfired at the time. Whether now it's too late or not is up, is up in the air. However, what we see is that the prices are already way above inflation and are already artificially inflated. And this is what already creates the right setup for a bubble. The other macroeconomics, um, uh, the other macroeconomics uh, figure that is very scary is income stagnation and, um, and zoning that prevents the supply to be growing, where even though you have more demand, if supply is not able to, to keep up because of zoning and other laws, then you're still going to have the, this prices until it explodes. So is, is our fee paid on the listing side, paid up front at closing? Actually, it is paid at, clo it is paid at closings. And all of our contracts are actually, uh, you can get out of them at any, any given time. We're so confident in our listing team and in our services that you can come in, you can test it, and you're going to stay just because it's awesome. In the, in the segment that is not a high end, yeah. there is not enough inventory. Absolutely. So if it's not enough inventory, I, I left it on purpose. So this is actually this is actually um, a great question. What we're saying is that there was not there is not enough inventory there is not inv uh, enough inventory uh, in the market in the mass mar in the mass market, uh, particularly single family homes. I'm, I'm adding this, uh, particularly the single family homes. And so why would the market crash when there is not enough inventory? Well, one of the problem is that the prices are keep on increasing and incre and increasing, whether because of of low interest rate or because of lack of supply is um, not necessarily would not be necessarily a problem if people were getting richer and richer at the same time. But with inflation being low and income being stagnating, people are being pushed away from their, from their housing and suddenly will not be able to afford to live there. When this, when this happens, they're going to be moving to other places and get the, pri the prices up. At some point, the prices that have been um, pushed up artificially by, um, by loans Will no longer have enough de demand to, uh, to will no longer have enough demand to sustain it, and people we, who have loans will start defaulting, and then everything will come crashing down. Which is basically what happened in the 2006 uh, market, and what is likely to be happening again. Anybody else? Yes. So what are we missing in technology? And uh, at this point that we do not have, why are we only 0.04% of the market instead of a bigger, a bigger juggernaut, if you will? Well, realistically, the technology is here. Um, but for the vast part of the market, they don't need it. As simple as that. The uh, clients are OK with the status quo. They don't like it. But there is a certain uh, lump sum that you have to invest, whether it's in time or in money, to, to learn something new. So currently, people are still using, for example, on the residential side, they're still using their friend of a friend who is a real estate agent because they'll give us a low percentage off or because they know somebody, etc. What will happen at the crisis is that that friend is no longer a real estate agent because he couldn't afford the $800 to renew his license. Um, people will now have to go and look for an alternative. And when they find a new alternative with the technology and they find a much better service, this will become the new normal. And when this becomes a new normal, they will no longer go back to the friend of a friend of a friend who happened to have a, to happen to have a license. So my example is true for the uh, residential, but I can make the same argument for investment. Currently, you make investment by finding somebody through a family office or trying to find a portfolio, and it's very, very difficult. Later on, right now, you could go to rooftalk.com and be able to find all of the great, like, an amazing transparency, but people don't use it because they have an alternative. When the alternative disappears because of the crisis, the new standard will be so, so much higher that the previous people will not be able to come back in. Yeah. 
Any uh, any other question? Yeah. So w will the, will the price fall further than ten uh, further than ten ten percent when the prices finally fall? The likelihood is yet in my in Miami. So Miami is actually better suited than most cities to um, uh, to absorb a recession, which is kind of weird because in the previous uh, in the previous um, in the in the previous recession it was actually hit very hard. But Miami has actually very lax zoning rules, and they're able to, to grow inventory a lot. Um, whether they grow the right inventory or not, that's different. They usually like to do buildings when there is a lot of demand for a single family home. But the fact that you're able to create more supply normalize the price, and this is one of the reasons why the price is currently at 10%. However, whenever there is a correction, it usually doesn't correct itself just by 10%. It will go down, but then it will recover a lot faster than in other markets. So Miami is actually better suited than other cities. Any, anybody else? Well, I'm, have, you, have you here? All right, I guess this is it. Thank you very much for your time. Have a, have a great day.